first panel we've seen with women on today, so that's exciting. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> now it's our turn. <laughs> um, okay, so a completely female lineup of panelists. Uh, these are my squad. These are, you know, powerful women mm -hmm. in the in the broadcast and media industry. I'm sure you've all got a lot to say. Um, I'm glad that uh, Vijay has already uh, announced all of your names, so I won't struggle or embarrass myself trying to say everyone's. Um, I think that not many of us in this room can argue that the traditional mold, this, this discussion is breaking the mold. The traditional mold that we all know, the model that is seen not just in media, but um, in, in the Middle East and across the globe, is a model that's predominantly led by men uh, with male leaders. So the... Uh, the ultimate leader, the boss's boss, the most high-ranking decision makers that we all work with and, and, and work al alongside are in general male. Um, and I think that that's a, a, a kind of global stat. Forbes magazine last month announced for the 2009 figures that female CEOs now have risen in number to a mighty 6.6% of CEOs in Forbes 500. Um, it's a small baby step in a, in a, a, a challenge that, w that we all have. And I think that one of the things that I want to kind of provide context to is that this is not a conversation for us as, as women alone on a, on a panel. This is, I hope this panel and this discussion will be uh, for everyone in the room. Um, so it's not going to be uh, too kind of whiny. Uh, but much more about <laughs> how, we can, how we can move forward and, and really be trailblazers in the industries that we work in. Um, okay, so moving on to, to the panel and, and a focus on empowerment and sisterhood that, that I've talked about, I would like to talk to these positive change makers um, and focus on two elements within this discussion. The first one, the experiences and challenges these ladies have seen or, or encountered in, in their careers, and the perceived limitations and stereotypes that we all know, um, you know, sometimes prevent women from holding senior positions, and the barriers to success that they have encountered. And, and the second part really is to discuss the wins as well as the woes. So what can we do, all of us, to empower change, to ensure that conversation and support for, you know, half of our workforces are there and enable a more level playing field. Whether it's uh, CEOs that are here or, or decision makers, how can we create that parity in the workforce? So, first of all, I'm sure our audience will be really excited and interested to understand your stories, where you come from, what you do, uh, just to really provide context to our conversation. So, Amanda, would you just give a brief overview and, and insight to the, to the audience of, of who you are and, and what you do. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tracy. Um, so thank you for so many of you being in the room. This uh, after lunch slot, always good. Um, look, for me, it's very simple. This is a conversation about diversity uh, and inclusion. And, you know, women being one aspect, but, you know, that's so much broader. And it's a, it's a no-brainer as far as I'm concerned. What diversity drives different thinking. Different thinking drives innovation. Innovation drives a competitive advantage. And thus, you know, diversity should be a priority for business. It shouldn't be optional. It's not a nice to have. If you want to uh, drive competitive advantage, you need different people with different opinions. And certainly, as we're all very aware, the broadcast industry right now is challenged in so many different ways that having the ability to think differently is absolutely crucial. So if you all, you know, have the same view from the same place, singing the same tune, it's going to be Nokia uh, or Kodak. So, you know, I think that's really crucial. For me, I mean, I've got to be honest, I'm fairly conflicted about being on this sort of a panel because, uh, you know, I, <laughs> you know, I, I am positive in the way that I lead discovery across the Middle East and Africa. But for me, it's about giving everybody an opportunity um, to do their best work, to enjoy being with us, and for us to succeed, therefore, as a company. Um, it's interesting for me that 50% you know, of my workforce in this region and my senior management team is women, 
my boss is a woman. I mean, I guess at Discovery, this concept of diversity is baked into our DNA just because we can't serve global audiences or tell global stories uh, across any screen unless we are thinking in a diverse way. Yeah. So I think, you know, for me, I've worked for <laughs> more than 30 years now, mostly outside. I mean, the majority of that time outside the UK. So I've been here for six years. Prior to this, I was in Asia Pacific for 17 years working across you know, Hong Kong, China, uh, Taipei, Singapore, Korea. Um, I've worked in Eastern Europe, I've worked in Russia, um, Middle East and Africa now my focus. But for me, it's about, you know, creating, I think, I think it's important that you have a positive workplace for everybody. And, and for that, you need flexibility, you need respect, you need work-life balance. But most importantly, people have got to enjoy what they do uh, irrespective of who they are. Absolutely. Um, and I think that that's a really good point, is that this, the, the themes and discussion that we'll have today is as much about a diverse workforce, whether they are male, female, young, old, uh, race, religion, whatever it is. So I think that that's a really good, good point to start um, on. Maysoon, you are the managing director of Nisa Radio. I'd love you to be able to expand a little bit on your, on your story that's super interesting uh, for me and, I, and I'm sure for the audience as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, for me, <laughs> which I also tend to agree with Amanda on certain things, um, it's a personal story and it's an empowerment that came from within. So uh, the issue of media, if I want to talk in the Arab world, possibly generally, and in Palestine, Palestine specifically, uh, women journalists face uh, discrimination and they face uh, the highest unemployment rate. We have lots of female graduates in, the, uh, in journalism, but they un end up unemployed. So when I established Nisa FM, the whole idea was about empowering women in media and through media. And it's a content where we empower women. Because exactly as you said, Amanda, inclusivity or inclusion means to us economic growth. If you involve the 50% of the population, then you can aspire to have uh, an economy which is, uh, which is dynamic. So the story of Nisa FM began 2000, in 2009. Next year, it will be 10 years on air in Palestine and beyond, as we are streaming on the website and uh, on Facebook. And uh, we recruit as many female journalists as we can. And uh, the content that we uh, focus on is on uh, women empowerment on uh, different levels, whether economic or even civic or uh, legal rights, uh, etc. So as a Palestinian woman, as an Arab Palestinian woman, I see that uh, we need empowerment in media. We need to change to do the shift between looking at women uh, in media as only beautiful faces and recognizing them as producers of media content rather than consumers only. So this is the story behind Nisa FM that's been on air now for 10 years and uh, it's been quite a success. We tend to uh, include men also on our board. Uh, so we have men and women working towards gender equality uh, on all levels in the society. Amazing. Congratulations. To Thank you. Mm. And, and Noha, do you want to give a, a, a little um, sure. uh, overview of, of who you are and, and, and what you do? Sure. Um, I am quite new to a new position at OSN. I'm heading the content for Wavo, the OTT platform. Uh, prior to that, I was heading presentation, uh, looking after the linear channels uh, for the network. Um, I've been in Dubai for just over four years, um, having the bulk of my experience uh, and life really lived outside, um, where really I feel quite uh, privileged in the sense that I come from New Zealand, where we have quite um, awesome women uh, role models. Um, uh, New Zealand was the first country in the world where women gained the right to vote. Uh, when I was growing up, we had uh, Helen Clark as... Uh, <coughs> thank you. Um, we had Helen Clark as uh, Prime Minister. Yeah. Uh, now we have Jacinda Ardern, mm -hmm. uh, who's uh, not only the youngest member um, uh, youngest Prime Minister in New Zealand, but also she gave birth during her term. She, you know, uh, breastfed her child in Parliament. Uh, she's uh, 
young and uh, quite inspiring. I also was uh, quite fortunate to have uh, role models in the workplace, uh, both at Sky TV and at MediaWorks, where um, you know I had uh, managers that were amazing women that I could look up to and aspire to. So coming to this region, you do see a lot of women in the media still, but uh, the further up you go, uh, the less you do encounter, which is uh, still an issue. Uh, so yes, um, I'm here, in, uh, you know, aspiring to become um, an inspiration to other young women uh, in the industry. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, Zara, do you want to, uh, you, you have uh, ch changed industry and, and moved into yeah. uh, uh, an OTT S4 platform and, and launched across the region. You, you head up Yup TV. Can you, can you give us a, a small background about your pathway? Uh, sure. Uh, actually, I'm just a woman born and raised in Beirut, Lebanon. God bless this country. Uh, I'm very happy to be here because, uh, because this discussion is about uh, diversity. It's about uh, the role of women. A perfect example is now what's happening on the streets of Lebanon, where women have been uh, criticized for being there while they're there fighting for a better life, for a better change. Um, uh, I, I grew up in a different industry. I grew up in an audit slash finance background, focusing on consulting, investment banking as well. And then I've made the move across different industries. I, I moved into media and I fell in love with that. But all of this journey was um, powered by a great, great woman leader who has coached me all the way. I had to leave university at an early age, but then there was a woman leader who has supported me throughout this journey and who's helped me finish my education. And I didn't stop studying until a few years back. So, uh, so that's where we come to the point that we as women, we need to do more for each other and, uh, and it's important that we help and grow each other. Uh, I made the move to media because it was part of my management consulting role, but then I fell in love with, with doing something, uh, growing something from scratch, and that's where we came and launched the Up TV here. We saw the business case. We saw that uh, there is a good population for that. So we launched, we've expanded. Um, as a woman, as, as, an, as an Arab woman, um, I believe there is a lot to do on the culture, on the environment. Um, companies have to understand that um, uh, women on board lead, uh, you know, uh, women on board have, 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 have great skills. When, when companies hire women on board or in executive uh, um, roles, they set an example that they value diversity of thought, they, they value um, uh, diversity of, of, um, of experience, which basically leads to the growth of the company, leads to better numbers, uh, lead to better opportunities. Brilliant. Absolutely, and there's some topics there that we will touch on as this, as this panel goes on. Um, Zoe, you're the, the founder, uh, uh, one of the founders of Nomad TV production. Um, it, it, give us a, a brief outline of, of you and, and, and how you got to that kind of space. Well, thank you for having me part of the panel. Um, yes, I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Nomad. We're a, a production company based here in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and we have an office now in London as well. We started up um, nearly 10 years ago now, and um, it was a husband and wife team. It's actually founded by myself and my husband, Phil. So we started off with a 50-50 ratio in terms of <laughs> men and women. And actually, um, I was discussing with Amanda earlier, we, I was totting up how many staff we have today, and we have exactly a 50-50 equality of women to men in our company now. Um, and with the hires that we are about to make over the next couple of weeks, we'll actually tip 
into the balance of more women to men. Um, I very much echo Amanda's comments in terms of the diversity, in terms of creating a, a balanced workforce that um, can be creative together, can work well together, to produce good content together. Um, our whole ethos is around storytelling and creativity. And you need a diverse range of people within your company, men and women, all different backgrounds, all different nationalities, to be able to create content to feed audiences over a wide range. So, yeah. So it's, a, it's definitely a, um, a subject that's at the heart of what we do, and we feel like balance is a massive part of what makes our company tick and makes us successful. So brilliant. I mean, I think that um, you, you know, media has a direct impact into the content that we make, the content that we distribute, and, and therefore, you know, what our audience see. As the can I say, be bold and say, the matriarch of media here, Amanda. In an <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In, a, in an industry like that you specialize in, in media, is it, could it be considered a less challenging industry for women? Um, I know that this morning we've had um, STEM, oh, sorry, a cloud or e-game conversations that has been predominantly discussed by, well, completely, uh, absolutely discussed by men. Is, is media one of the, the kind of industries that you find more women in than maybe other industries? What's the, is it less challenging for women or do you, do you find that media really um, ha has those challenges as well? Gosh, thanks. Um, <laughs> I'm still reeling from the matriarch comment. Sorry. Uh, okay, so look, I don't like the idea of media being easier. Uh, so clearly I'm not going to sign up to that one. I think actually what I'd like to do is pick up on a comment that Zara made because it was a really important one and I think that irrespective of industry, uh, what we need to drive diversity and inclusion is, to your point, sponsors um, or mentors, however you want to describe it. So in, I think you, you all touched on it and I think you know, we probably are sitting here as a result of people who have helped us. Uh, certainly I have been super lucky to have had men and women support me uh, through my career. Um, I think to a certain extent you have to go out and find them yourself because you know, you're in charge of your own career, you have to take responsibility for that. But it's very helpful to have at different stages of your career elder, older people who are more experienced, who can help, who can open doors and so on. So that's the first thing I would say in any industry. Yeah. Um, for me, again, the, the point here is, I mean, a lot of people talk about the glass ceiling, and you've mentioned it, you know, the, the fabulous 6% of women CEOs, C-suite, whatever. In this region, I would actually argue that the reverse is the opposite. It, the reverse is more important, and it's really at the bottom. It's like, a, it's not a glass ceiling, it's a broken rung at the bottom of the ladder. Because what we're seeing is that women are not, you know, for whatever reason, being put into that first manager level position. So, you know, there are statistics, uh, there's a recent McKinsey report, which is a really good one, uh, which talks about the fact that for every 100 men getting that first manager level position, only 72 women globally are getting that. So you're already getting a disparity, which means by the time you get to the top end, you know, which is already the sort of pointy pyramid, there's less women in the first place to even promote. What I think is interesting is that actually when you do get to that top end, it's more, it's more often the woman is promoted because there is then that understanding of what diversity can do. But so I like to focus, certainly where I can make an impact, I focus on the, the bottom, that people who are coming up through executive functions where they have functional expertise and are beginning to have excellence there, but then they need that manager level and that's where they need the support. Yeah. And then again, that ties into, at this point you lose a lot of women to having families and, and you know, then that ties into all of this. It's an ecosystem that you also then need flexible working, you know, all of the rest of it. But, but I think that we should, I mean, everybody in this room can do something about this, man, man or woman, you know, you can mentor, you can sponsor, you can make sure that you are supporting people so that at least they're getting onto the ladder. That's the first part. Absolutely, and I think if you, if you look, I'm sure that we've all, uh, you know, read and, and, uh, and, and, and read and, and are interested in, in this kind of ecosystem that you talk about. One of, the, one of the things that I find really interesting is in the Middle East, more women than men attend university. Mm. So you're looking at, a, on average, 60-40 split between, and, and, 
UAE, Saudi, Kuwait all have that sort of 60 40 split between university uh, for women and, and men. Obviously, that step into the workplace and that step up the ladder is, is, the, is the missing part, as, as you say. Um, it's <clears throat> clearly not education, um, but maybe opportunity. And I think that one thing that struck me when you all introduced yourselves is that you. you um, linked yourselves to a leader or a, a mentor or and so I think that of that six percent of CEOs or the, or those female leaders in companies they kind of are exaggerated in 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 how important they are to a, a, a female or a diverse workspace because you you then have someone to to kind of look up to or, or lead from below potentially I think that for um, kind of our children's generation where STEM and cloud and IT are much more important subjects, maybe that will resonate in the industries they choose later on and maybe media is, is, was maybe more of a, an industry that people could, could go into w when we started. Um, Maysoon, can you expand on some of the barriers that you've encountered, uh, particularly in the region, um, you're obviously entrepreneurial in, in spirit and, and have created this, this wonderful uh, radio station um, and uh, have been recognized as a social change maker. So what, what, what's your secret? Can you expand on, on the challenges that you've had and, and what you've done? Yeah, uh, I just want to elab elaborate on the challenges, uh, in my opinion and my experience, for women uh, working in media in the region. I think there's lots of uh, societal, societal constraints when it comes to, for example, working late at night as journalists. Work conditions we, uh, for journalists are not always um, available to provide a safe environment to work in. We may encounter sometimes harassments with the female journalists, and I'm talking about a region where I come from, plus unequal pay, plus conditions of uh, maternity, and I mean, uh, I know very well that sometimes it's not accepted if a woman uh, gets pregnant, if she's married and gets pregnant, that she remains at the job place and so on. So all these are restrictions that journalists, in my opinion, face, and it hinders them from reaching the, uh, media, their media goals and even becoming CEOs and seniors. And on the topic of the glass ceiling, I would say that media is a very important tool to, to be able to break the ceiling and allow women to really excel and to go, uh, to go further up as CEOs and in senior positions, generally speaking. For us, when we started the radio station, it was all about social impact. And this is why the content of the radio station is very inspirational. And when we say social change, it means that finding changes happening inside the society that support women on all levels, whether to drive them to become more active in the society as an economic force or even as a leader in their own community. So the content itself is very, uh, uh, is raising awareness on different issues uh, around women and their empowerment. Plus, it's, it is a content that also challenges certain taboos and laws inside the society. Uh, so, for example, whenever we have a radio show that concerns, uh, let's say, um, a challenge uh, uh, pertaining around uh, access to courts for women or divorce or so on, we tend to bring two guests to talk about it and we tend to be very objective. And the idea behind every show is to raise awareness and tackle the issue in a way that could engage the formal sector and the informal one so that eventually we have like an advocacy campaign where uh, change is made. And we have, we, we have had... A, extremely, I mean, live cases on that, where we are now discussing in extensively in Palestine, along with the Palestinian Ministry of Women Affairs, the issue of inheritance, and how people can uh, misunderstand it uh, in terms of religion, and where uh, traditions and customs apply, making it uh, a little bit uh, in the gray, let's say. So these are things that we uh, really discuss, and very core issues, so that we can have the social impact and the change that we, we aspire for. Mm. And it's really, it must feel really tangible. It is very tangible because we do some measurements and we do some monitoring and evaluation and we assess it on how, much, how many women have we affected in our, in our role and uh, we do the, that through survey, focus groups and so on. So it is scientifically proven and that's why I say media is a very powerful tool. Uh, you need a long breath to go but it can really make the change that you really want. And especially radio in our case, because it's very accessible and cheap medium. And of course, it's now connected to social media. Mm. So we have the two tools together working in order to make the necessary uh, change. Cool. 
And, uh, I mean, I think that the, there's a kind of a variety of whether it's tangible or, or, or not, that small change kind of makes difference, whether it's having a panel like this discussion or, or I mean, enormous change where, where it's kind of socially um, kind of taken on and, and education and, and, mm. and conversation. Um, I think that, you know, with your new role, Noha, in, in content and editorial, there are, um, you know, there are barriers of entry for, for many people, women included. Um, are there specific traits that you've come across or, or know about that, that, whether they're imagined or real, that women have that kind of limit their career success? Every network, every large network I have worked for has always had quite an even workforce. So I've seen that in New Zealand, I've seen it in uh, Qatar, I've seen it here in Dubai. So we do have departments that you know, tip the scale with more women in the room than men, content being one, um, marketing, PR. But when we speak of a sales force or more so IT and broadcast, as we can see from lots of gentlemen in the room here today that does tend to be more um, male dominated. But at the end of the day, I think if we're speaking regionally, there is, in general, content is more um, consumed by women. We, mm. uh, media in general is more consumed by women. So it comes naturally, particularly in a, we're in a position, in a programming content position. Uh, that you'll see more women um, do these roles. Um, but I think as media and technology kind of continue merging, we should be a little bit concerned. We should be um, more focused on how women can remain successful in the industry. Uh, there is already obviously a lack in the number of uh, women in executive roles or uh, board members, particularly in this region, but more so for, as you said, management roles, entry-level roles, um, and the more we can do to, by we, I mean women in, in content, um, to learn basic um, coding functions to understand mm. how to um, manage um, how your content is displayed, how your content is curated. We're moving more and more towards algorithms doing the work for us. So how our point of view is still very relevant and very important. So we need to learn technically how we can still relay that information to the algorithms of tomorrow. It, I mean, it's too important to leave it to men, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good point. Uh, silence. Uh, where's the claps? Um, OK, so um, I, I think, uh, Zara, if, if we look at your uh, CV or, or, or what you've done previously, it's been a much more male-dominated field of finance and risk assessment are, are those kind of fields that stereotypically are, are more male. Um, how, are you how do you feel that space that has traditionally been occupied by a male, male counterpart? Um, what differentiates the women that, that take on those roles? Um, look, uh, now, now women have uh, this amazing skill of asking the right question in a helpful way. You know, when, when you're on board and the CEO and the management team are under fire, then they need someone to ask the right question, <coughs> the question that has to be asked in a helpful, constructive way. So uh, that's a skill that women have. But then uh, looking into, into the industry itself today, uh, today I, I run a media company. And looking into media itself, I'll take you back to an event that has happened in February last year when we launched our product in Kuwait. So it was a great launch event. I come into the stage and the room was double the size of this room. I come on the stage to announce the launch, and I'm the only woman in the room. Um, 
so I looked into the people and I was like, what an ugly truth, what an ugly reality, you know? Uh, but then, but then I stepped up and, uh, you know, I said, well, this means change is happening. The fact that I'm here means change is happening. And I've made a clear comment also on media that, that uh, today um, uh, we need more women on board, not only in here, but also in other countries across the Middle East. Because yes, we're talking about it here, but if you look into other countries, we still have a long, long way to go. And this was a great example of that. Uh, companies, companies will have will have to to um, you know. Today, a woman a woman is is capable. I say, she runs a house. She, she runs a business. Uh, this is stamina. This is persistence. Uh, she puts the ego on the side sometimes and she gets the job done. And this is what businesses need uh, nowadays. I, I, I do remember that uh, seven days after I've delivered my child, I had to attend a board uh, meeting for one of my clients. I had to do that because of the perception, the perception that women with kids, pregnant women might not perform at the same level. But looking back at it 10 years ago, it shouldn't have been the case. Um, so, so definitely, definitely we have a long way to go, but we are on the right track and, uh, and we're improving. Absolutely, and I think that, I mean there's so many t topics that we could we could sort of veer off on. Um, I, we will we will come back if we have time because I think that there's lots of lots of things that I'm sure that we all want to say. Um, I, I think one of the touch points that we, we've already kind of moved towards is is the content, Zoe, and and with Nomad being a production company that that specialises in in documentary and factual uh, content. How does that female workforce, that 50-50 that you say was there from the, from the start and, and, you've, and you've continued and, and expanded on, how does that influence the nature of production that, that you do? Well, I think it's just, it's incredibly important if you're going to create content that is going to reach a wider audience as possible, to have a pool of people creating that content that is reflective of that. That's, you know, a diverse range, as men and women, I touched on it earlier, but men, women, all different backgrounds, all different nationalities. For us as a production house, it's important that we have all of those minds that we can, we can go to for creativity, that we can go to for ideas, to be able to create content for a vast variety of different clients and broadcasters, especially in a region like this, which is so diverse. Um, our clients want to speak to as wide a population as possible. They're not looking to just, most of the time, majority of the time, not looking to just speak to men or just speak to women. They want to be able to capture everybody's imagination. And for us, building our team, it's not about having a, a woman or a, a man as such. It's about having the best minds to create the best content. And we're lucky that we've been able to create a really diverse team as part of our company. And that's been something that's you know, a, a real focus for us. And I think it's a benefit for the type of content that we create. You have to have the people that can make snap decisions. You have to have the people who um, actually plan and think more methodically about it. Um, women, I guess, stereotypically tend to be more empathetic, but we also have very empathetic men as well. Um, and they all come together to create that content. It's about who has the talent, who has um, the ideas to create that kind of content. Um, for us, it's if you have that, then we will push you forward and we will develop you. And we are very much about sort of bringing people forward, bringing people up, um, letting them make decisions, giving them empowerment to become managers. And actually, we see very much in the stuff that we've gathered over the years, a lot of the, the management team that are coming now underneath 
our sort of uh, partners at the top of the company are majority women. They they are make it. They are becoming the decision makers, and um, you know, actually managing projects as well as being the creative force behind it as well. And I think it's important to have that diversity to be able to create diverse content. So how do does I, I open this up to the entire panel? How do we how do we counter that that balance between? Okay, we we all kind of understand that, that diversity is important so that you can have a, a cross-reference of your audience ultimately reflecting in your boardroom or in your content development team or it, you know, in your radio station production or, or, or whatever you do. How much should be determined and defined from a kind of corporate level of a, of a tick box of diverse numbers and how much should be on the skills people bring? Because it's that really hard balance, isn't it? Is that you don't want to put someone into a position just because they tick a box or they, they, they give you the, the assumption of diversity. You, as you said, Zoe, you need the best people for the yeah. job. Well, for us, I mean, we're about creating quality content. So what comes first is the talent. So we're not really, you know, we, you need the diversity, but if you have the talent to create that content, it doesn't matter how old you are or who you are, where your background's from, we'll champion you, bring you through, and, and give you the opportunity. And I think that's important. For, <laughs> I'll be very quick. But for us, um, I mean, it is more or less about equal opportunity, as you're just saying, but uh, sometimes, um, because we are re there to really create jobs for female journalists, we tend to take more women. But we realize that certain fields and certain specialities, women are not there for them. Like the technical side, we were, we were never able to find uh, uh, a, a person who can go to transmitters and, you know, attend to all these things that's related to radio broadcasting. As well as the, I mean, the technology side, when it came to social media, we battled to have the right person to do the job for us, and eventually we shifted to the, uh, to have, we opted to have a, a male on, uh, on the team to do it. But it's more or less, yes, where you find your talent, and the, I mean, we go according to talent, and, 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 I, and I think this is the way to do it, not to discriminate, rather than look at the talent where you find it, whether male or female, and eventually do it. And I, much of that I agree to. We often, I mean, we have to think of, uh, we have to consider some great athletes, um, some fantastic uh, world-class runners would never be where they are today if they were not plucked out of their environment and given the right support and given the right expertise by people with power that were then enabled to become worldwide successes. We, especially in this region, we need to consider the fact that in our biggest market, KSA, women are just now entering the workforce. This is the first generation of women entering the workforce mm -hmm. in our biggest market. We need to not just rely on the fact that they have come into the workforce, but also enable them, give them the right support and power so that they can rise to positions of power, so that they can become the next generation's uh, inspiration. Well, uh, yeah. So, I, I believe that, that there is a reality in the market uh, and in the industry. I'm not sure how many companies here attending um, have some board structure that forces retirement of board members after a certain period or forces um, uh, some turnover across board seats. You see a board member, he sits there for 10, 15 years, and so on. And that's, that's the reality of the industry because you have different shareholders, you have whatever. So, uh, so I guess it also has to do with the policy enforcing uh, turnover across board seats enforcing uh, retirement after certain uh, certain age. Um, turnover also facilitates the, the diversity of mind. It facilitates new blood, gets the company to perform better. 
but unfortunately, the reality as of now, uh, people stay on board for, for, for more than seven, eight years. But, but this, this is changing. There is more awareness on the corporate governance of, of companies now. Uh, but, but uh, you know, I guess it's going to take time for women to be, uh, to have a larger representation on, on, on boards. Yeah, I mean, I would say that I think it is changing, and this is an area where you have to stay positive and focused, and there are actions that we can take. So, you know, if you look at the statistics in the UAE, uh, in 1990, there were 29% uh, women in the workforce. Now, today, it's 42%, nearly 43%. So you can see that things are changing. But what you can do about it is, you know, how do you speed it up? How do you mm -hmm. turbocharge that? And there's lots of ways to do that. So, you know, we've talked about what you do at the beginning, at the entry level, how you support people. Even to get them to that level in the first place, there's things that you can do in terms of, you know, training, recruitment training, mm -hmm. where you train out bias. You know, so it's, it's, a, it's a known fact from the research that when you are starting in your career and you don't have a huge track record, you know, this to my point about, you know, 100 men for every 72 women, men are looked at more. The bias is to look at men more for future potential, interestingly, whereas when you look at a woman, it's more about what is the track record. And if you don't have a track record because you were at the beginning, then you, that's not ideal. Mm -hmm. So I would say that, you know, all of us in this room can look at our recruitment policies um, and see how we can try to reduce bias and reduce the barriers so that, you know, to the point that we've all made on this panel, you're hiring the best people. Um, I think that's really important. But, you know, I also think you have to be positive and you have to call it when you see it. So I'm often uh, in positions where I'm the only woman in the room. It's normal for me in, in my career and in the markets that I've worked in. And you you know, I have to make it clear to people in the room that, you know, I'm not the note taker, I'm not making the tea, I'm not the party planner, and I'm also not the mother. Um, and you just have to operate and be consistent and positive and clearly respectful, but you have to make the point. So, you know, it's not for shrinking violets, but uh, you have to call it when you see it. So we at Discovery Globally are very into this idea of, you know, what we call microaggressions. It's like when you are, when you're, when you're called into question, when your judgment is challenged purely from a, a, a racial or a gender bias, not factual, you know, that needs to be called out at the moment that it happens. It's like, that's not acceptable behavior. We don't do that. Um, now, clearly, it's easier. I have a different experience than you do. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been more in, in big corporates. Um, but I would say that how leaders model their behavior is really crucial. Yeah. And you have to be consistent and authentic about it. If I and that everybody can do that, by the way. You, man, woman, whatever. Mm. I agree. It's about creating role models mm. within yeah. companies that can be strong female role models, strong male role models, but strong female role models that can um, show the younger generations coming up through that you, you can be a woman at the top of the company, you can be strong you can be a leader, um, but still, you know, at the top of your game. And that, that is a possibility for all of those juniors coming up through the ranks, the, the managers coming up through the ranks. They have those role models at the top. And I think actually we're lucky in the UAE in a sense to have quite a lot of strong female role models in, in media. Um, okay. If you look a, across, across the, the Emirates, I mean, just on this panel, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of strong media. Um, uh, leadership, but you know, the, I think we're actually it's, it's tra changing in the UAE, and I think um, there is quite an emphasis on empowering women in the UAE, and that is it is changing, it is growing, and it's a positive movement. And uh, do you other ladies think that you can you can call out bi uh, gender bias uh, in the environments you work in? If I may follow up on one thing that you said, because it's very important that the number, the percentage of Arab women who is educated is very good and very high. So I think we really need to take advantage of this point. If a woman is provided with the right support at the home level and even outside, I mean, the, the home level, then we can see more and more women in 
in the in the labor force and possibly in the in senior positions but the fact that the education level is very high is, is an advantage in my opinion and really we need to make sure that this 50 percent of the population is very much involved in the uh, in the economy on, on higher levels sorry what was the other thing you asked i mean I, just can you, you can you call out uh, that's what you do i mean you shine a light on some of this which is important yes i mean can we? Wa I'm sorry. There's an echo. There is. So, I know it's an echoey. Sorry, I'm, I'm not phrasing it very well. So, as Amanda said, you, you shine a light on a on a particular issue that, that you you support fully and are, are powerfully changing. Do you think, in general terms, that those dis discovery or, or Viacom models of um, diversity and inclusion can be implemented everywhere? Do you want to answer that? Yes, but regionally, I've, I've felt a difference. There, there is, there's always been a, quite a always-on culture within media. Um, you are expected to perform, do more, senior management, do more, work extra hours, yes. But I felt it even more here. It's more difficult in this mm. region as a woman to kind of keep this work-life balance. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's just me, but, you know, I was quite self-conscious of it. I'm a stickler for leaving on time because I've got my second job to do at home. I've still got mm -hmm. this, this and that to do. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go chill out. So I've always been quite strict on leaving on time. But when I came here, I noticed people would stare, you know, God knows what they're thinking. Like, oh, she's, she's off, you know. <laughs> but I kept doing it because I wanted to set this example for people mm. around me. It is, it's not good enough that you sit mm. here till God knows what time. What about your family? And in the Middle East, the culture is actually more tolerant of men who give up their family time for work that's more culturally accepted here that, than it is in the West. Mm. When Cigarettes, actually, not even family time. <laughs> <laughs> that Sorry, too. I missed that. Sorry, say that again. True. Cigarette breaks, not even family time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> As well. <laughs> so. I think it's an important point is that, um, you know, as Amanda briefly touched on earlier, is that there, there is a, for a vast majority of women, there is a natural career break if they, if they want to have a family. Um, and I think that... Is that 18 years? Sorry. I, <laughs> but there's no, you can't, you can't say a career break for family because some, some women, okay, will take three months off and come back into work. We are actually quite privileged here, so we're able to have a, some help at home. Mm -hmm. um, back home in New Zealand, it's much more difficult. Uh, child, the pay, paying for childcare and so mm -hmm. forth, it's, it's not an easy task. But taking a break to raise a family is no, I like mean, th years, Physically, right? you like, can't be in an office. It's, you know, a, no, a man also yes. raises a family, yes. uh, potentially, but they don't, they don't have to f physically not be there for, even if it's two weeks or 45 days. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, oh. <laughs> funky for you. Um, so, I, but I, I think though, those, um, the, you know, how do you feel about the framework that, that is here to, to support that as, as much? Are, are women risky options in the workplace? Are they, are they risky because they go off and have children or they're emotional or they're uh, hysterical? <laughs> you know, we, we know all of these words. We're just warming up for Jaya. Um, so, you know, what, what Look, I, I, I've, always, I've often voiced the Western view that if you are unable to finish your work in the allocated time, you are either incompetent or under-resourced. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. So if you're not able to get home to your family, male or female, there is a problem there. It, it should be as simple as that. And yeah, I, I, will, I will conclude at that note. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, look, I, I think I repeat what I said. It's about creating a culture that is inclusive, flexible, supportive, respectful for everybody. But, you know, given that this drives an, in a, a business imperative and makes you a better company, you know, and therefore more successful, why would you not look at this? 
It's, it's you know, incomprehensible to me that you wouldn't want that for your workforce and thus to drive better results. So uh, I think in this region, you know, linking it to business performance and having it as not optional is, is really crucial. I, I think you're... Yeah, it's the, the, you know, the conclusion is, is having the framework, having the, you know, you have the competence, we need the, the confidence to employ that in our, in, in our businesses so that it's, it's reflected in what we do and, and ultimately success. And that's what we're all striving for, right? Thank you very much.